Uh, this morning, we are launching a series called The Power of Routine. And uh, we all have routines in our life. Uh, routines are good. Sometimes when we talk about habits, it kind of has a negative connotation to it. Uh, so we won't, we won't talk about habits this morning, or at least not today. Uh, but we'll talk about routines and the power of routines. And when you think about all the routines in your life that you have accumulated, <clears throat> You kind of have to stop and think about it because most of the time you are on absolute autopilot. You do the routine without even thinking about it because it's become really a part of who you are. It's really changed everything. Uh, how many would say that hygiene is a good routine? <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's and, and here's the deal. The things that we take for granted sometimes, if you stopped doing them, not only would you notice, especially with the hygiene, but everyone else would notice as well. <clears throat> so we really like the hygiene routine, okay? Can I get an amen? I mean, is that like, you know, right? Uh, what about exercise, okay? Some of you are like, let's not talk about that. So they say that like New Year's resolutions Everybody keeps those until about the 16th. So if you go to the gym, it's going to be packed till about the 16th, and then people start to fall off. If they have someone keeping them accountable or someone training them, boy, it's a whole lot longer because they're not just doing it themselves. Okay, They actually have somebody that is encouraging them and keeping them accountable. <clears throat> but these cardio, doing, doing weights and things like that, those are... Not everybody's routine, I got it, I got it. Uh, but they're powerful routines and they actually help give us energy and actually help keep some of the pancake breakfast off of us. Right? Who's starting tomorrow? No, just, okay. So um, then there's eating, right? You know, we, we like to eat, don't we? Isn't it become routine? Somebody was asking Drew today if, you know, they were telling him, hey, you're growing too, too tall, too fast. I told you last week that you'd need to eat every other day. <laughs> and he informed them this morning he eats every other hour, which I think is about right uh, for a teenage uh, boy, okay? But think of, you know, dairy and meats and vegetables. Some of us still struggle with vegetables. Who are you? Who are you that still struggle with vegetables? I, I know you're out there, okay? I like the ones I go to. I used to have to put, and I know corn is not a vegetable, it's a, it's a starch, right? But <clears throat> I remember as a kid, my, my mom putting ketchup on my corn, and that was the only way that I would eat it. That sounds really gross to me now, so I have no idea why that was even somewhat appealing to me at the time. Uh, but think about it. If you were to eat only Dunkin' Donuts every day, <laughs> right? And now, you may have dreamt about that at one time, but I would say that is a poor routine. That would, that would not serve you well. I mean, even teenagers, you can get away with that one for a little bit longer, but I mean, those of us that are 40 or older, I mean, we're gonna blow up like a balloon if we do that. There are routines that are important, and even there needs to be balance, right, within those routines. Uh, there's financial routines, you know? Obviously, we like the spending routine financially. That one's fun. Who, who enjoys the spending routine? There's about 80% of you who are lying right now. Who likes the saving routine? Like, oh, like, we're in church. Let's say that one. Yeah, saving, that's a good routine. That's a good routine. How many percent don't save, Brett? It's, I'm pre, you probably got that right off the top of your head. 78% don't save money. And there's like, I think it's about that that uh, go paycheck to paycheck as well on there. There's good routines. So there's power uh, in routines. And uh, routines are good. If we stopped routines, it would be a bad thing. If you stopped changing the oil on your car, it might get you 20,000. 
miles. Before that car croaks, there's power in the routine. So look, we're going to be talking each week about some different routines. And we're going to be talking specifically about spiritual routines this morning, specifically about the power of Scripture, all right, the power of God's Word uh, in our life, what it, what it does and how it changes us. Uh, God's Word acts, absolutely changes us. And so the big idea this morning is consistency in God's Word is the key. Consistency is the key to growth. Consistency in God's Word is a key, is the key uh, to growth. So 2 Timothy 3.14, we, we actually talked about the scripture not too long ago. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.14 through 17 says, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. This is Paul talk, talking to Timothy. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the holy scriptures from trial, childhood and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip people to do every good work. How many good works? Every good work, right? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word today. God, I just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds. God, that we would receive it and that we would apply it. We thank you for what you're going to do today, God. Transform us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're looking at the routine of Scripture, and I want to say the daily routine of Scripture, <clears throat> and how powerful the daily routine. Now, Here's the deal. Before we even start into this, there's a whole lot of guilt associated with missing, specifically spiritual routines. And I want to release you from that. Um, God loves you regardless of whether you do his routine or not, or regardless of whether you get into his word or not. I'm going to tell you this morning, you're so much better when you get into God's word. But if you have gone through a slump, or you have maybe, you're like, you can't even remember the last time you read God's word, or Christmas like took you away from, you know, just managing life over Christmas, all, and oh, I'm just telling you, hit the reset button, and if you miss a day or two this week, hit the reset button, just keep working on the routine, because the truth is the power of God's word changes us. So I, I'm trying to help you release yourself of guilt. There's no, there's no rule here that says, you know, <laughs> every day you must get into God's word or you'll die. I mean, I, I haven't found that scripture. But I do know that God's word changes us. And so I'm encouraging you this morning, embrace God's word, make it a regular practice, and watch what God does. Okay? Anybody out there this morning? I know Terrell is. I keep hearing him. <laughs> okay, so the routine of Scripture, it, first of all, it teaches us truth. Uh, remember true or false in school? <laughs> I loved those. Now, look, there was only a 50 50% chance, but I just, there was something about true and false. I was like, you know, it's kind of like Bible or not. Anyone listen to WGTS and they're like, Bible or not? <laughs> and I'm, and like, if, they, if there's anybody that should know, right, I should, I should know, right? But I'm like, I'm like, oh, are you serious? Oh, no, 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 that is, that is so not, not Bible, right? <clears throat> but true, true or false, we are in a serious true, truth, da, truth drought, couldn't even say it. We are in a serious truth drought, right now because everybody wants to be God and everybody wants to live the way they want to live. They don't want to turn to the truth. They just want to live the way they want to live. They want to be worldly. We're in a serious 
truth, drought. We are always looking for truth. We want to actually know the truth. Uh, the truth changes us, and actually it gives us a foundation of where to stand. When we don't have any type of standard, we don't have any type of truth, there's nowhere to stand. You can't move forward if you're not standing from a firm foundation. And truth gives us that firm foundation. And so we see all sorts of ads and all sorts of things that are constantly, you know, in front of us. <clears throat> and I was watching something actually with Cassidy this week talking about the pictures of food on TV, the difference between what we see on TV or like, have you ever seen the semi-truck go by, <clears throat> right, with the massive burger? I'm a burger guy, okay? I like burgers. I grew up on hamburgers and hot dogs, you know? And so, <laughs> and look at me, no. Um, anyhow, <laughs> anyhow, but, but the difference between seeing that and what you actually get. Have you actually compared those? And, but you still see what you saw in the advertisement. You're not even looking at what you're, I mean, you're just like pounding it, you know? You're not even looking. So there's this, there's this truth. <clears throat> there's this discrepancy that's there. It's, it's like the ad that says, just do this exercise for 10 minutes every day and you'll have abs like the person doing. <laughs> Isn't that the biggest joke? And, and there's, but people believe that. If I do that ab roller, remember the ab roller, right? If I do the ab roller for 10 minutes a day, I'm going to look like him or I'm going to look like her. We want to know. We want to know the truth and we want our lives to actually match up uh, to the truth. We're in a serious truth out so the Bible tells us absolute truth, truth for all times and all circumstances. Did you catch that? Some of you need to write that down. We don't have it on the screen. It's absolute truth, truth for all times and all circumstances. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is what. What is true? What is pure? What is right? What is correct? Really works in this life. John 17, 17, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is that work in. Truth purifies us. It purifies us when we receive it. We embrace it. Amazing tech crew on the planet, guys. I'm not I'm not just saying that. I'm 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 for real. <laughs> Alicia's back there waving at me. <clears throat> um, so the routine of Scripture, first of all, teaches us truth. Secondly, it does this. It corrects us when we're wrong. Uh, do you like to be wrong? <laughs> Most of us don't like to be wrong. There's many times in my life when I've been wrong. Uh, I got a brand new 1991 Geostorm which is laughable, that's why you're snickering. <clears throat> I had two of them, but uh, it got worse just then when I said that. But uh, in 1991, I was trying to give the first oil change. Now, I'd done oil changes many, many times, okay? My dad taught me how to, teach, how to change my oil. It was a big deal, because it was always about saving money. Did you ever grow up in that household? I mean, my dad would never get any car with air conditioning. <laughs> I mean, so back when you had a choice, right? <clears throat> now I don't know, do they actually sell cars without air conditioning? I don't know. But anyhow, 
Back in the day when you had a choice, my dad would never pick the car uh, with air conditioning. He would always, you know, take one for the team. And, and, you know, he would be the one commuting to UPS every day, and he would just, you know, roll down the window, whatever, and, and that, was just, that was just the deal. That, that was how it happened. So, you know, he taught us, me and my brother, how to change oil, and it was something that we did on a regular basis and, and um, regular routine uh, for us. And so I thought, hey, I got this new car. I got this, no problem, no need for the what? No need for the manual, Okay, no need for the manual. I can figure this out. It's got to be just right here, right? It's, it's, the oil plug is right here, right? Like it is on every car. So uh, I changed the oil. Now, <clears throat> to my chagrin, I, I was changing the oil, and I'm like, oh, they've come up with a new color. <laughs> Red. It's a new color. It's a new color of oil. This is, this is a brand new car. They're like, we need color in our life. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's change it for everybody and it'll be wonderful. This is my 18-year-old brain, okay? And uh, so I changed my oil and then I added oil. <laughs> and um, I checked the oil because my dad said you should always check the oil after you've added the oil to make sure that you have enough oil. And all of a sudden, I had a major problem because I had way too much oil and had no idea what I did. <clears throat> so what did I change, guys? I changed the transmission fluid, not the oil, and I had a big mess. Anyhow, and I had some friends that helped me get out of it. <clears throat> But being wrong is no fun. It's no fun. And, and I was 18 and I was arrogant. I was straight up arrogant. I had the world by the tail. I'd been to Saudi. I'd been, I mean, I just, I, I, I had an inflated view of self that was not good and uh, wasn't really listening uh, to people and I thought my parents were old-fashioned, and, and uh, they didn't, you know, they, even with God, I just thought, you know, that's, that's all good for you guys. I'm doing just fine here um, on my own, uh, about three years later is when I came around. But um, we, don't like to be, we don't like to be wrong. But 2 Timothy 3, 16, the latter half of that verse says, it corrects us, God's word, it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is Right. Now, I, if I would have looked at the manual, I'd have been in much better shape, right? If I, if I would have humbled myself and looked at the manual. In the Old Testament, there was King David. And look, King David was what? He was king. Kings don't need nobody. They're king. Anything they say happens and goes and here the troops were out to war and David decided he was going to stay home and he's up on his balcony and all of a sudden he says who? Bathsheba. Anyhow. And all of a sudden he lusts for her, desires her, calls for her Who's going to say no to the king? I just, I just need to talk to her. I just need to talk to her. I just need to, I don't know. I just need to talk to her. That's all. <laughs> Can you imagine that conversation? Anyhow. So, he sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. Then he, King David, tries to call Uriah from the field, tries to get him to sleep with his wife so that they could clear this up. He won't do it because he's such an honorable man. Won't even go home to be with his wife because he knows the troops that he's committed and loyal to are out there fighting the battle. <laughs> so King David comes up with another plan and sends a message, sends Uriah with the message 
that ultimately led to his death. The troops pull back. All of a sudden, Uriah is trying to figure out, hey, guys, where you at? And he's killed in battle. Well, they think everything's good, right? Bathsheba has the baby, and all of a sudden, God sends the prophet Nathan. If you're interested in reading the full story, it's first, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And um, Nathan comes to the king and tells him this story, that there was a certain town, there was a rich man, and there was a, a poor man. The rich man had sheep and herds and, I mean, he had everything. The poor man had one little lamb that he bought with his own money, and he cared for that little lamb. And all of a sudden, there was a visitor who came, a guest who came to the rich man's house. And instead of the rich man killing one of the sheep from his own flock, he took the lamb from the poor man killed it, and fed it to his guest. Well, David is just pulled hook, line, and sinker into the story, and he says, that man deserves death. And here was Nathan's words. You are that man. Mic drop, right? And there were serious consequences to it. David, David was wrong. He was wrong. 2 Samuel 12, 9, why then, this is Nathan talking to David, why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. So here's the powerful thing about this, okay? David is described as a man after God's own heart. And now you're like, are you serious? Didn't you just say, you just gave this story and he's a man after God's own heart? Here was the difference. When God corrected David, it was his response. His response. This is something so powerful, guys. When we are corrected on anything, when God's word corrects us, our response is huge. It's huge. It changes everything. In fact, if you're a parent in this room and you've just nuked your child over something, you know, you're just like, I don't know, it could be anything, right? <laughs> Pastor Andy, do you ever yell at your kids? <laughs> Am I breathing? <laughs> Sometimes, yes, I crook out. But isn't the response, parents, isn't the response from your child, doesn't that change everything? Determine, it determines what happens next. And this was David. There were serious consequences to what had happened. The child was gonna die, guys. This was, this, there were serious consequences. But the response from David was absolutely huge. It changed everything. It changed everything. I don't have the scripture up here, but I'm going to read it. You can write it down on your bulletin, Psalm 51. Just a couple of verses of it here, verses 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me, purify me from my sin. When we are corrected, 
Our response changes everything. And that was certainly the case with David. Our response to correction, when we read God's word and we bump up against something that we know we are doing against God's word, our response is absolutely crucial. It is huge to what happens next. Consequences by the grace of God are actually less than what they would have been otherwise. So God uses his word to correct us. <clears throat> we can quickly learn what is wrong with us when we read God's word. In a routine of reading scripture every day, um, receiving it and applying it to our lives really helps us move forward. And I'm encouraging you today to start, not out of guilt, but out of a desire to grow and become all that God wants you to be. Amen? <clears throat> what else does the routine of Scripture do? It prepares us for the future. Um, how many of us can see the future? <laughs> <clears throat> if you could, it would be you and not the person from New Hampshire that won the lotto. <laughs> the one ticket, $570 million. Okay. Living this life is a lot like driving in the dark. Isn't it? We're driving in the dark. We don't drive with the headlights off because that would be stupid. We drive with our headlights on. But even with that, we can only see so far. In fact, there are speed limits to protect us from driving too fast with our headlights on. Because we can drive too fast for what? For conditions, right? We can drive too fast for the conditions, the environment that we are in. And so living this life is a lot like driving in the dark. We can't go too fast because we will overrun how far we can see. And we just can't see very far. We can't see the future. And so 2 Timothy 3, 17 says God uses it or uses his word to prepare us, to prepare and equip us, his people, to do every good work. And so it prepares us for the future. We can't see very far. We'd love to say that we can see far. Don't, don't you wish you could, you know, like, God, just let me see. I just want to. But God prepares us. He prepares us for the future. And so as we surrender our lives to the Lord each day, he's constantly preparing us for what is coming ahead. Do you believe that? He's constantly preparing you for what's down the line. What's down one year? For like, well, who, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I can guess what's down a year. What about five years? What about, what about 10 years down the road? 15, 20 years down the road? It's very difficult to see, and so we have to trust God that he is preparing us, and his word says that he is. When God can see the beginning from the end, we have to trust him. We have to trust him. And so, um, 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this, it says, no eye has seen no ear has heard and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Prepared for those who love him. And so I can think of scripture as a, as a kid, and I, I went to a Christian school from second grade through seventh grade, and, and um, scripture memorization was a very big deal uh, at the Christian school. It was a, it was a huge thing for me even when I strayed from God. You hear me? Even when 
I had a three-year leave the Lord time, okay? The scriptures that were already in me were preparing me for where I am today. Do you understand? God, God prepares us. He prepares us as we engage his word. And, and some of you in this room, I, I know that you're thinking, oh, you know, my child or, you know, they're not serving God right now. Um, God's word is in them. And scripture says it will never turn void. It will always, here's what that means, because some of you guys are like, boy, does that like a check? What is that? You know, what does that mean? Uh, kind of a thing. Um, it will always accomplish its purpose. It will always accomplish its purpose. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you think I could see at 18, 19, 20, 21 that I could see this today? Oh. <laughs> Driving my geo storm, woo! You know? No. No, I couldn't, I couldn't see that. But some of the very scriptures that I committed to memory as a child were the scriptures that prepared me for the future. The future of where I am today. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will test and approve what his will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. These are scriptures that were implanted in me as a child. His word will always accomplish its purpose. Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes into the hills from whence comes, comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It prepares us for the future. Psalm 23, 23 the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I shall not want It prepares us. It also does this, it equips us. It equips us for service. There are good works that God has given us to do. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we could do the good things he planned for us long ago. The Lord makes us and this is so crucial. If you're a single person here, don't be looking for someone to complete you. I'm just looking for my other half in life. <laughs> the Lord completes you. Amen. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Philippians 1.6. The Lord completes you. He gives us what we need to accomplish the tasks that he's assigned for us. You're never going to be everything that you need to be to do what God has called you to do. Because at that point, you wouldn't need God. We stay in this needy position. So that we'll do this every day. Going, God, I, I can't do this. I'll never be the husband that I need to be. I'll never be the father that you need me to be. We feel that way, right? 
in our roles that we have, it keeps us in this position because it's the Lord who does the work in us and through us for his honor and his glory. Second Timothy 2, 21 through 22 says this, if you keep yourself pure, someone say pure. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship, companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. This, my friends, is God's word. It is truth that changes us changes us. I'm going to have Chris Call come and join me this morning. If you could spend the day with one famous person, who would it be? Chris Call. <laughs> That's why I called him up here. <laughs> you think of all the people that you could spend time with. I don't know who comes to your mind. Someone that you wish, boy, I, I, they could give me the answers on whatever. You know, my favorite president was President Reagan. I thought he was awesome. I actually stood in the rotunda and I waited all night to uh, walk by his casket he was, as he was laying in state uh, back in 2004, I think it was. Never got any time with him. Other than that, he was there. But there's something about spending every day with Jesus. And if you're in his word, you're spending every day with Jesus, the creator of the universe. And so I've called Chris... up here to talk to you about the power of Scripture in his life. Happy New Year, South County. This is a great challenge that Andy has put forth, uh, and he's laid out so much fodder for me with the Scriptures he's quoted. I, I just want to go back to Romans 12, too, about... Uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How many of you have ever asked what God's will is in your life? A few hands. Well, there's the answer right in 12.2. So that you may test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's one thing he had to say. He talked about 2 Timothy about keeping your way pure. Psalms tells us, and let me just say this, whenever I see scripture say, how can a young man, for example, say that? In Genesis it says God created them man, male and female he created them. So I consider it to apply to everybody here. But how can a young man keep his way pure? By hiding his word in my heart. He uses it. He used it in Andy's life. It comes down to this for me. Um, this is the most important possession I have, bar none. And if I were to lose it, even just this copy of it, it would drive me nuts because there's so many notes in here. Uh, I am not opposed to electronic copies of the Bible. I use them on my desktop my iPad, my phone, but I use them for study. I thought about the biggest benefit to me of reading God's Word every day over the past 30 plus years has been familiarity. If somebody mentions a scripture, I can almost picture it. 
where it is on the page, which column, how far down. It's because of familiarity. So I thought, how could I explain what, to me, reading uh, daily on a scrolling text, uh, every copy of the electronic Bible I've got, you scroll through it, you don't flip pages and, and save it. It'd be like waking up with my wife, Callie, having a new face every day. I mean, it'd be hard to, to become familiar with her. And I want to be familiar with my wife. I want to be familiar with God's Word. Every month, I bring about 40 copies of a daily devotional called Bible Pathway. I've been using it for 30 plus years to take me through the Bible every year. And Brett was full of statistics about saving, but do you know that those of us who call ourselves Christians, only about 10 to 15 percent have ever read all the way through the Bible just once. And Romans 14, 12 tells us one day we're going to have to give an account of ourselves to God. So I'm going to finish with just two scriptures. Hard for me to stop with just two, but it's what got me started doing this. How many of you want to be prosperous and successful in this life? Thank you. If anybody raises their hands on my next question, I'm going to get right off of this stage. Who wants to be destroyed? Nobody. So do me a favor. Write two scriptures down that you can look up later for yourselves and read. Joshua 1.8 says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may do according to it, then you will be prosperous and successful. Hosea 4.6, write that one down. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And knowledge in that case refers to truth. And Andy has told you from John 17.17, 17, your word is truth, Lord. We have the extreme privilege of having Jesus, the Word, come to us in the flesh and dwelt among us. He left this for us. This is the owner's manual for your life. If you have ever read an owner's manual for a car, this is more important. It would be my prayer that just one person here today responding to this would read through God's Word. I ask you to prayerfully consider it. Thanks, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Chris has been a great friend for a long time um, and walked with me through a lot. A uh, real mentor to me and I don't think I know another person that knows scripture like Chris does. <clears throat> He'll tell me, hey, do you know what blah, 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 scripture says? And I'm like, I bet you're going to tell me. <laughs> God's word is powerful. It transforms us. There's nothing like it. We are so blessed with the museum of the Bible, so close, and we're going to pick a date uh, to uh, try to get as many of you there as, as possible. 430,000 square feet. Um, it's not the Bible museum where you go look at a bunch of Bibles. <laughs> we had to clarify that for some relatives. That was fun. But uh, the museum of the Bible, it is an amazing, amazing place, and uh, I hope that you'll take advantage of it. Uh, even if you go by yourself and we do it together, you're not gonna lose. I've already been there twice. Um, it's powerful. Here's, here's what I'd like to do uh, to kind of close things out today. And the worship team is just gonna continue to, to kind of play softly here. 
I want you to text. I don't know if we got it up on screen or not. Uh, if there's not a, a number there on screen, okay? I'm going to give you a number, and I want you to text your favorite scripture, okay? Some of you, that might be a challenge. Some of you are like, you don't have enough time or text messages. We got a limited text message. We'll be, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. But I'm going to give you a number, and I want you to text us your favorite scriptures, okay? If you have one, two, three, whatever, but you need to put your name with it, okay? Because your number's going to come across to this, and we're probably not going to know who you are. <laughs> so you need to put your name there. Because we're going to put something together, and we're going to see it. See, our theme for the year is intentional what? Together. Intentional together. We're going to put something together that shows everyone's favorite scriptures. And we're going to have that scrolling uh, on Sundays. And I, my prayer is that the power of God's word will transform you. will transform us together. So you ready for the number? Okay, it's a 703. Oh, look at that. Man, we're technologically amazing. So that's the number. Take a couple minutes. Let's think about it today. Send your favorite scripture as the band just kind of plays softly here for a moment. Send it to us today. My number's not up there, but somebody's texting me. <laughs> you might be here today, and you're like, I don't have a favorite scripture. In fact, I don't even have one that I can remember, the, as Chris would say, the address on. Here's what's going to happen. As we get all these scriptures, as you're sending them, here's where the transformation is going to take place. You're going to begin to see these scriptures, and all of a sudden, you're going to have a favorite scripture because you're going to recognize, wow, that one right there, boom. And you're going to embrace God's word and you're going to be different. You're going to be different. Intentional together. That's what we're working on this year. The routine of scripture, getting to know God. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you need to say yes to him today, just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Begin to transform me. And then begin reading God's word. An additional challenge here as we get ready to close today. We're going to be taking intentional steps to grow together. And so... Uh, we have a copy of Russ Mason's book. Some of you had purchased that when he was here. But we have a copy of Becoming a Champion uh, that we would love you to have. And so uh, as you exit service today, you're going to have a copy uh, of that. Take that home. And I'm challenging families around the dinner table. Okay, if, you're a, if you have a family, okay, that uh, if you're a single person, embrace that. Take it, read it as well as your as a supplement maybe even to what devotional you're walking through right now. But my challenge is for families in particular uh, to, at the dinner table, go through each day 
read whatever corresponding proverb it is. Obviously, tomorrow would be Proverbs chapter 1, and you're reading day 1 of that book together. Begin to discuss it and let Proverbs begin to change how you think and, and get into your family. Okay, we're going to be doing that over the next uh, 31 days uh, together. So we have that book for you, and we'll pass that out to you. Do we, where do we have those at, babe? The right of the doors? Okay, I'm uh, having a hard, hard time reading the lips, sorry. <laughs> okay, they're out there. How's that? For those of you that have connection cards today, and you want to make sure that uh, you get that turned in uh, with a prayer request on it, et cetera. We have God cans at the back door uh, for you to put those connection cards in there. And we're going to be pr- praying specifically for you uh, tomorrow. Would you stand with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I sense your presence. And I'm so grateful for it. Grateful for you, God. I'm grateful because your presence is priceless. And as we worship you, as we lift up your name, we lift up your truth, your written word. God, we're forever changed. And so God, I pray, Lord, that you would transform us. God, as we begin this new year, Lord, we pray that your word would get into us, that we would embrace your word, we wouldn't shy away from it, We wouldn't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but we would embrace your truth that transforms. And God, when we do that, our lives are gonna be changed, our families are gonna be changed, our jobs can be changed, our schools can be changed, God, because we're embracing your truth and we're applying it to our lives, we're living truth out, and that truth is a name, Jesus. So we thank you, God, for what you're gonna accomplish in us. We give you all the glory, the power, and the honor, because it's due you anyway. We ask this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. Can you give him some praise? Yeah, come on. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. God bless you guys. Have a great week.